Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're going to work out what uh, gamma eva the gamma function evaluated at a half is. Okay, so just by definition, we're going just back to the definition now. Gamma of a half is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity t to the power of x, which in this case is a half, minus 1 e to the negative t dt. Okay, so a half minus 1 is just negative a half, so what we end up with is the integral from 0 to infinity e to the negative t over, uh, well, um, it's over the square root of t, basically, dt. Okay, right, uh, now, uh, uh, this is going to seem a bit unmotivated at the start, uh, but I promise you, you will see what it, what the point of this is. So we're going to say, let's make a substitution. Let t equal u squared over 2, basically. Okay, and the reason we're going to do that is because if we get u squared over 2 in there, in that exponent, because we're going to replace t with u squared over 2, then it's going to look very like a normal distribution, like the PDF for a, nor a standard normal distribution. And then basically what we're going to do is reduce this down uh, to uh, the integral uh, that we um, that we worked out long ago for the PDF of the normal dis uh, standard normal distribution. Okay, so uh, if we want to make that substitution, we're going to let t equal u squared over 2. Then if t is equal to 0, that implies that u is equal to 0. And if t is equal to infinity, that implies u is equal to infinity. So the altered limits are still 0 to infinity. Then what we're going to do is put in e to the negative u squared over 2. And then we need to replace dt. So we're going to get dt by du is equal to uh, 2u over, oh no, sorry, uh, well, it goes to 2u over 2, so that's just going to be equal to u. Okay, right, now if we substitute in t is equal to u squared over 2 in there, what we're going to get is the square root of u squared over 2, and now we substitute in dt, uh, which is going to be equal to u du now, because uh, dt, if uh, well, this is bad maths, but it's, it's good intuitive maths, that dt is equal to u du, splitting up the uh, differential, uh, the well, um, yes, <laughs> not rigorous at all, but uh, intuitively that's a nice statement. Okay, right, uh, now, uh, split this up here, uh, this becomes the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the negative u squared over 2. Now, the square root of u squared is just equal to u, and then what you get is divided by the square root of 2, uh, u du again. Okay, so the u's cancel. This square root of 2, uh, we divide it by 1 over the square root of 2. Now, uh, that's the same as multiplying by the square root of 2. So, take that all out and just multiply by the square root of 2 there. So, we end up basically with... Uh, the square root of 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity e to the negative u squared over 2 du. Okay, and now what I want to do is remind you of how we calculated this integral long, long ago uh, when we did uh, standard normals. Okay, right, so intuitively this is the integral of, if we draw the PDF of the standard normal, remember the PDF of the standard normal is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 pi e to the negative u squared over 2. That's the PDF of the standard normal. So that looks something like this bell-shaped curve here. Okay? Right. So we are now asking, what is the integral from 0 to infinity? So we're asking, what is the area underneath here, basically? Uh, so that's what we're trying to work out. Now, the way in which you do that is you imagine rotating this you imagine rotating this around 360 degrees. So get rid of this bit, and now imagine rotating this around the axis. So create a new, make it now 3D. So create a new axis down there. So this is the, let's say, um, oh, we'll call this the, um, we'll call this, what should we call this? We'll call this our Z axis up here. We'll call this our Y axis down here and our X axis down here. And now what I want you to do is rotate this graph basically around like that and create me a surface, a surface of revolution like that. And basically what you end up with is something that looks like a molehill. So it'll go down like this. On this side it'll go down like this as well. So I shouldn't have crossed it out really. But um, it'll basically look something like that, okay? So it's a molehill. Now, uh, if we want to work out uh, the area of that molehill, uh, 
then there are two ways to do it, and that's what's uh, the key to this. Uh, one way we can do, and one way will reduce to this integral here, basically. Okay, so one way of doing this integral is to calculate it just like you would a, uh, the volume under a surface of revolution. So you say, okay, right, um, imagine if we've rotated this orange bit around to get these. So if we want to work out the volume, then what we can do is imagine taking up a tiny little bit like that delta x, take up a tiny little interval down around here, and imagine what that traces out when you revolve it around. It's going to basically revolve around like this, and it's going to make a tiny little sort of um, annulus, basically, of volume underneath this curve. Now, what is the volume of that annulus? So basically, what I'm doing is I'm, if we look, we're now looking down from above. So this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. We've got some little point here. We said take a tiny little interval delta x and rotate. We've rotated this round here, and we basically want to know. This is our annulus here. We basically want to know what's the volume under this annulus or under this surface for this annulus. So what we want to know is what is the um, the volume underneath the surface when we're just looking at our domain as being this annulus. So I don't care about uh, the volume under the entire surface at the moment. I just care about the volume uh, underneath the surface that is above this annulus, basically. So. Um, if I get another pen to highlight it, I want the volume underneath this bit of the surface here, basically. Well, if we make delta x small enough, then what we can view, we can view uh, the z value as not changing. If we make delta x small enough, then we can view the z axis, the z value as not changing. Therefore, what we end up with, basically, is a constant height uh, cylinder like this. So that's half of it then it will come around this way as well. So it's going to be constant height if we make delta x small enough, where it can be approximated as having a depth constant height. And now, uh, what's the volume of that? Well, you could overcomplicate this by a huge amount, but we're going to make it very simple, basically. As delta x gets very, very small, what you would really need to do is, we've now got this constant height here, which we're going to assume is just uh, this function. Let's say z is a function of x, um, oh no, uh, well we've got this function here. Remember the height evaluated at x is going to be uh, e to the negative x squared um, over 2. So we're trying to take this integral here basically. So let's say this function, uh, this function here, this orange function here, is just going to be uh, e to the negative and it will be x squared over 2 basically. So that's that function. It looks like this bell-shaped curve. We've revolved that round and we now want the area, sorry, the volume under this annulus, this blue annulus. Now we said it's got to, if we make delta x small enough, it's going to have a fixed height and that height is going to be e to the negative x squared i. It's going to be the height of this function, this orange function here, the original function e to the negative x squared, evaluated at that point x. Okay? Intuitive enough. Right. Now, that's the height. What we then need to do is multiply that by the area of this annulus, and that will give us the volume of that little cylinder thing there. Now, really what we would have to do if we wanted to work out the area of this is we'd have to take the area of the bigger circle and subtract the area of the smaller circle. That will, however, give us a quadratic uh, structure, and we don't want that. We want, um, we want uh, a linear structure, and basically what we can do is approximate it. We can say if delta x is really, really, really tiny, then we can approximate the area of this annulus as being the circumference uh, the circumference of the inner circle, which is um, which is two pi times the di uh, two pi times the radius rather two pi times the radius, and the radius is just x, isn't it? Because it's the distance you are this distance here basically. Uh, that distance there is x. Okay, uh, and that's the radius of the inner circle. So two pi times x is the circumference of that inner circle, and basically we can just times it by delta x. That works. It converges on being true if you make delta x really, really small. Okay, so therefore the volume uh, underneath uh, the volume of this annulus is going to be e to the negative x squared over two, the height of the annulus, times the area of the uh, sorry, the, that's the height of the cylinder, the, times the area of the annulus, 2 pi x times delta x, basically, 
And then what we want to do is add up all of that for all along from zero to infinity. So we want to get all the annuluses of every possible radius. So this becomes, we let this converge to zero dx and we integrate it from zero to infinity. That's not a rigorous argument, but it's an intuitive argument for what we're doing. Okay, so in the spirit of applied maths, that's a nice nice way of viewing what we're doing. Okay, so that will give us the volume underneath this molehill, basically, the volume underneath this surface of revolution. And what's nice about that is that it's an integral that we can actually perform um, because uh, the anti, sorry, because there's a very nice um, there's a very nice antiderivative to this structure because this x squared over 2, if we differentiate that, it comes down and it becomes this x here. So it looks like we're just inverting the chain rule here, which is exactly what we're going to do. Okay, and I will continue this discussion in the next video.